Hello guys, sorry about that. I just did a long introduction and I was I had actually muted myself so nobody could hear me, uh, unfortunately. But that's okay. Um, yeah, this week's webinar is called Advanced Formulas and Functions in Excel. Uh, and I'm joined by Deborah Ashby, um, my colleague here who, as many of you will know, uh, does a lot of these live classes with me because she is a, a Microsoft Office trainer and a uh, Microsoft Office specialist rather, and a Microsoft certified trainer. She's been working with Microsoft products for twenty years, and uh, she really is a, a great source of knowledge uh, for anything like that, and and is a very experienced trainer too. So uh, you're in you're in very good hands this week. Um, if you have any questions or would like to speak to either of us. Uh, at all in any way or if you have any problems that we may be able to help with just please go ahead and pop them in the questions box uh, i'll be monitoring that um, as best i can throughout uh, and we'll try and relay things if not if we can't get to them at the, before the end of the webinar we shall do so uh, via email afterwards so hopefully anything you ask should be answered um, without further ado i'm going to uh, pass you on to deb uh, who's going to take you through till for about the next 55 minutes. Thanks a lot, guys. Lovely. Thank you very much, James. I hope you can all hear me. As I said, we had a little bit of a problem there. James was doing his lovely introduction, as he always does, and unfortunately, none of you heard it. Um, <laughs> And he did have a very nice introduction on the first go round, and he left out all the good bits on the second time round, but never mind, we'll save that for, for next week. Good afternoon, everybody. There's quite a few of you on the uh, webinar today, so welcome to everyone. Some of you may have attended these before. Um, some of you, this might be your, your first time, or maybe you've been to a couple of others that haven't been hosted by myself. Um, so James has already done a little bit of an introduction, um, so I won't waste too much more time, but I always do think it is quite nice to be able to put a face to the voice that you can hear. So that is me. I am the in-house IT trainer here. And um, yeah, I basically look after anything that's Microsoft related and get to run webinars like this for you lovely people. So today we are taking a look at advanced Excel formulas and functions, which is always a little bit scary. When I saw this one on the schedule, even I was like, oh, going to have to swat up on that one because um, uh, even though I train Excel, probably formulas, I don't tend to use that much in my day-to-day -day job, and I think that's probably the same for a lot of people. There's probably some functions or some formulas that you maybe use frequently, um, but you know, there's normally around 10 which people will use, and there may be 10 others which they'll use occasionally from time to time. So the way that I'm going to structure this session um, is basically we're going to jump into some spreadsheets, we're going to do some live demos, and there is so much to this topic. There's probably about 450, I think it is 450 formulas or functions that you have in Excel. So obviously we've only got 55 minutes, it would be impossible to go through absolutely everything. So I've kind of had to cherry pick out the things that I think are going to be most useful to you. And again, with so many people on the call today, I, I'm sure we've got a very varied skill set. So there might be some of you on here who um, have a more basic knowledge of Excel formulas, and there might be some of you on here which are very advanced. So I kind of tried to go for the middle ground in between. So we're not going to go right from the basics. We're going to cover a few fundamentals just to kind of get you on track. And then we'll go into some of the more advanced features of some of the most common formulas that you're more likely to come across in your spreadsheet. As I said, I apologize if you're hoping that I'm going to do a formula and I don't get around to doing that one. Um, as James said, if you've got any questions, please do type them into the chat and we will endeavor to answer them for you. All right, without further ado, let's jump straight into what we're taking a look at today. So I'm going to open up our first spreadsheet. And there is a little bit of jumping around through spreadsheets today, so I apologize for that. 
What I want to do is basically just start out by um, recapping a little bit because this is a really, really important point in, in Excel and it is one of the basics when it comes to constructing formulas and again, I don't know what your, your level of knowledge is when it comes to kind of making your own formulas and things like that, but we're going to talk a little bit about the order of operators and if you're not sure what I mean by that, I'm talking about these little things just here. So those probably look reasonably familiar to you. You're you're all used to seeing formulas that have brackets or parentheses is the proper name. I should start calling them that instead of brackets. Um, we then have the little carrot symbol, which um, does anybody know what that is? I'm going to throw that question out. So if you want to type into chat, who knows what this little carrot symbol does? I've got some answers coming in. Yes, that's right. So to the power of that is. So I'm going to show you just a quick little formula using that. Um, that's probably the, the least common um, out of all of the, the others. You're probably used to using the others, maybe not so much the power symbol. And then we have our asterisk, which is our multiplication, our little slash, which is division, and then our addition and subtraction. And it's really important in Excel the order that these are placed in the formula because it is very, very easy when you're writing a formula to... Um, um, the for, for the formula to give you an incorrect answer just because you haven't understood the order of operators that you need to use. So I'm not going to linger too long on this because I think if you have been using formulas for a while, you're probably familiar with this, but I just want to show you very quickly uh, what I mean by that and how easy it is to get an answer wrong just by not using these correctly. So what I have here is just a little piece of data. We've got some months running across here, so January to June, some, some figures, and then we've got some um, regions of the world. And what I basically want to work out is I want to work out the, uh, or calculate the percentage of change. So the amount of change between uh, the months. So uh, between 30 and 40, 40, 35, 35, 43, so on and so forth. But I want to calculate it as a percentage. Okay, so I can see quite clearly here that the difference between February and January is 10. Okay, um, so what I'm really looking for here, if we were to work this out, I already know that that's going to be 33%. Okay, so let's just type in the formula that works out the percentage of that change. So we're going to start all of our formulas with an equal sign in here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select cell C16 and I'm just going to do minus. B16, which is going to give me the answer of 10. Now, to get that as a, a percentage, you need to divide it by this number as well. So I would need to do divided by this again to get the answer that I'm looking for. So the answer I'm looking for, bearing in mind, is 33% here. Now, if I press enter, what do I actually get? I get 39. So let's see why it's doing that. If we double click back on the cell to expose the formula, why is it actually giving me 39? Well, let's have a look. Let's work through it and see what it's actually doing. So we've got C16, which is 40, and then we've got minus B16 divided by B16. So what is 30 divided by 30? That's 1 and then we're minusing it from the 40. That's what Excel is doing, and that's how it's getting to the answer of 39. Now, that's not correct, and the reason is is because we needed to add in some parentheses into this formula. The parentheses will always tell Excel which calculation to perform first. So by adding in parentheses around here, so I'm going to say add one in there and just here, when I press enter, what that now is going to do, it's going to do that calculation within those parentheses first. So it's going to do 40 minus 30, which will give us 10, and then it's going to divide it by 30, which will give us our percentage which we need. And when I press enter, it gives me 0 0.33333. Now, the reason why it's given me that is because I haven't got this cell formula, uh, form, sorry, formatted as a percentage. You can have a look up on the home ribbon just here and in the number group, and you'll see it's just as a general number format at the moment. So as soon as I change that to percentage format, it's going to give me that 33 and I can, if I want to get rid of some decimal places, I can just use my little um, increase decimal and decrease decimal if I need to adjust that like so. 
Okay, so really that is just to illustrate the importance of putting in those brackets and if you leave them out, how it can give you a completely different answer that you weren't expecting. What I can then do with my formula, as with most formulas, I can then use my autofill handle. So when I hover over the bottom corner, I get that little black cross, and I can just drag that formula across to give me my answers. So here, obviously, there's been a decrease between these two, which is why it's saying minus 13%. So really, really important. And the way to remember the order that these operators go in, and this might take you back to high school. I vaguely remember doing this in maths class when I was very young many moons ago. Um, and that is the BODMAS rule. So if you type out, if you write out BODMAS, B-O-D-M-A-S, that stands for brackets over division, multiplication, addition, and subtraction. And that's how I kind of remember what order Excel is going to do the calculations in. Okay, so as I said, I'm not going to linger too long on that, but I just wanted to make sure that we all understood that because that is a really, really important part which can um, kind of make your formulas go wrong if you don't understand it and don't get it right. <laughs> Very briefly, before we move on to the next exercise, um, I just want to just show you very quickly how to use the power symbol as well. So um, again, with this, it's very simple. You can just type in equals to start your um, formula. And then I'm just going to select this cell just here, C15. And then if I do my little caret sign and do to the power of 2 and press Enter, that's going to give me my result. The opposite of the power symbol is essentially doing a square root of a number. And there is also a formula available to work out square roots as well. And again, if you press equals and start to type SQ, you'll see it comes up in that little drop down list, SQRT, and it says returns the square root of a number. So I can select that and I can do the square root of the number above, close the bracket and that will give me 6. So you've got the two there which are kind of opposites of each other. The power which will increase the number and then the square root which will uh, bring that number down. Okay, so as I said that's probably the least used out of all of uh, the operators. Lovely. All right, so let's move on. And as I said, there are so many functions in Excel. There's, there is, I think there is 450 in there. And for me, when I'm using Excel, and I am by no means, even though I train this, as I said before, I would no means class myself as an expert in every single function. I personally haven't used every single function. I doubt there are many people in the world who have used every single function in Excel. And as I said, you'll probably find that there are 10 or so that you might use on a regular basis, probably things like SAM, average, min, max, uh, maybe the odd if statement, things like that. And then there might be a five more or so that you might use very occasionally. The biggest problem for me is having a problem in front of me and then knowing which function to use or which function I should be using in order to solve whatever it is I'm trying to do on my spreadsheet. Now, your functions and your formulas are all located on the formula ribbon. So if you cast your eyes to the top of the screen, we're going to click on formulas. And you'll see here, this is where all your formulas are stored, in your function library. And um, they're stored or they're, they're categorized. So you can see here we have financial, logical, text, data and time, sorry, date and time, look up, so on and so forth. And if you click the little drop downs, this is where you'll find all of the financial related functions, uh, your logical functions like if, if error, things like that, text functions, date and time, so on and so forth. There's also more functions on the end here, which when you click it, you've got extra groups in here. So there's a, a group specifically for people who work in engineering. So don't forget about that little more functions on the end as well. Now what you'll have that will help you find your functions is a recently used button just here as well. So this will contain the last 10 functions that you use. So I'm kind of, I kind of use the same ones over and over again, so I normally find it's quicker for me to just go into there and uh, pull up the one that I'm looking for. And then of course next to that we have the most common function, which even if you're a very basic Excel user, you've probably encountered the sum average uh, functions at least, and possibly count max and min as well. So they have their own little group because they're the most common. Now what you can do is if I just click recently used again, for example this top function here is the PMT function which we're going to look at in a moment. 
if you hover your mouse over any function, it will give you a little pop-up which will give you a brief explanation of what that function is going to do. And you'll see underneath that there is a tell me more link as well. So if I click on tell me more for this particular function, it opens up a little dialog box or it opens up the Excel 2016 help. Now if I was looking for a function to specifically solve a problem, so maybe I was trying to work out loan payments, I could type in loan payments, so essentially what I want to do, click on the search button and there we go, the top one there is the PMT function it's given me there. So you can kind of type a description of what you're trying to do and Excel will try and match that to the closest function. So that's a nice way of trying to find out um, which function you should be using as well. Okay, so just a couple of little tips in there just to help you when you're finding the functions that you need. All right, now let's jump across to the insert function spreadsheet and as we've been speaking about the PMT function I am just going to show you that and again I find this quite useful for when I'm doing calculations um, outside of work actually I, I use this more at, at home because it's, it's useful for things like working out your monthly payments if you borrow a certain amount of money from a bank at a certain interest rate over a certain period working out what your monthly payments are and that is the PMT function it stands for payment essentially um, I'm going to show you this um, you might find that it's something uh, that you're going to find really useful. Um, if not, then it is just a good introduction into constructing formulas as well. So it's quite a nice one to be able to do. All right, so let's click in cell B6. Now, the scenario that we have here is basically what I just explained. So we've got, um, we're going to borrow an amount of 25,000 pounds or dollars. Um, over a period of 48 months or four years at an interest rate of 3.5%. And what I want Excel to do is work out what my monthly payments are going to be based on that information. So what you can do is you can type in equals and then type PMT with an open bracket and you can do it this way just by typing it in and once you get familiar with constructing formulas this is the way that you'll probably prefer to do it however my advice would be if you are fairly new or you're not as confident with your formulas as yet always use the function up here because it's kind of like a little wizard which will walk you through the process of constructing your formula now, I've got mine in recently used. If you don't have it in there, you can also, if you don't want to look th through every single category, you do have an insert function button just here. And you can just type in, again, a description of what you're looking for. Or if you know the name, you can just type in PMT and click go, and it will pull that up like so. And then it's going to open up this little dialog box. So let's start inputting in some of that information. Now, I find these dialog boxes really useful, as I said, particularly when you're fairly new. So let's just have a look at what it says underneath. So it's saying what it's going to be doing, which is calculate the payment for a loan based on constant payments and a constant interest rate. So this is basically the information that we have here. We have our interest rate, we have our term, and we know how much we're borrowing. So then, because I'm clicked in rate, I then get a little explanation as to what needs to go in there. And sometimes these are helpful, sometimes are these are a little bit confusing. I always think to myself, you could have worded that a lot simpler whenever I read those. <laughs> but sometimes they can be quite helpful. Um, but this one says, um, this is the interest rate uh, per period for the loan. And then it says, for example, use 6% divided by 4 for quarterly payments. So. Our rate that we're using, our interest rate, is this just here. So I'm going to click on cell B2 to put that in. Now what I need to do now is I need to, as it's got down here, where they've put 6% divided by 4 for quarterly payments, I'm paying on, I'm trying to work out the monthly payment, not the quarterly. So I want to divide mine by 12 as opposed to by 4, okay? So because I want it by month, essentially. So I'm dividing my interest rate by 12, and I'm then going to click in the NPER field. So this is the total number of payments for the loan. So that's fairly straightforward, 48, because we're gonna pay over a period of four years. And then PV is essentially the present value. So the total amount um, that a series of future payments is worth now. Again, that's a complicated way of just saying the amount that you're borrowing essentially. So I'm gonna put that into there. I'm gonna hit enter or press okay. 
and that's going to give us our answer. So that is my monthly payment um, for this particular loan, $558.90. Um, now, does anybody know, and I'm going to ask you to type this into the chat window, you can see that their result has come out in a red font. Does anybody know what that means? What does a red font normally mean when you've done a formula in Excel? Does anybody know the answer to that? If you just want to type it into the chat window. Exactly right, negative value. So it sort of seems a little bit strange, but the way they kind of look at this is that that, that money is leaving you essentially. So that's why they, it's in there as a negative value. That's fine, but sometimes you might want to then use that calculation in maybe another spreadsheet or something else. And it is a lot easier to work with positive numbers as opposed to negative numbers. So what you can do, just to very quickly turn this into a positive number, which won't change the result essentially, is double click to go in and edit your formula. And if you just click your mouse before the amount borrowed, which is in cell B4, and just make that amount a minus figure, that will then make the result a positive figure. And then it's a lot easier to work with if you're including that in other formulas or you have it linked through to other things as well. Okay, so this is just a very quick uh, way of using the, the PMT function, so quite a nice little function. Of course, again, I could copy this across by using my autofill handle, going across like so. You can see the data that we have above. This is a much larger figure, so this might be something like uh, maybe we've got a mortgage over this period at 3.75%, and that is our monthly payment for our mortgage. Okay, so just a very quick introduction to the PMT function and just starting to get used to constructing those formulas and using the dialog box. Lovely. Let's jump across to AutoSum. Now, I call this section expanding the capabilities of the sum function. I'm not going to go over the sum function. I'm sure if you're attending an advanced uh, formulas course, you're probably all fairly familiar with the AutoSum. Super helpful by far the most common um, function that people use in their Excel spreadsheet can work out totals really quickly. I just wanted to show you a couple of little shortcuts in here which can um, make things even quicker for you. So we've got some numbers just here, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, and we've got some figures in there. So I might just very quickly want to work out the total for this. Now I could click on my auto sum button, that's also very quick, hit enter and I've got my total. But another thing that I could do is I could press Alt and equals. Oops, sorry. And that will do the same thing. So holding down the Alt key, pressing the equals will also very quickly do your auto sum for you. It becomes even quicker when you want to add up blocks of numbers. So again, what I could do is I could highlight my numbers before, like so do alt equals and that's going to give me my total at the bottom just there and I might want to add a little heading. I could do the same for a larger range of numbers so I could highlight all of these just here and then do alt equals and that's going to very quickly give me my totals at the bottom as well. So all equals is a nice little shortcut way of just applying that auto sum function really, really quickly. We can do the same when we're dealing with um, time. Now, time is always a little bit strange in Excel, and I, I don't know if I entirely like the way that time works, because it, it is kind of overly confusing. I myself don't even really know why it's done this way, um, but you can see here, as an example, we have um, hours and minutes listed just here. So, four hours, 39 minutes, so on and so forth. Now, if I want to add up these hours and minutes, I might think, okay, so I'm just going to do alt equals, which is my auto sum, hit enter, but it gives me 338. I can see quite clearly from the numbers that are above that, that if you add all those together, that does not equal 338. Now, I'm not quite sure, maybe somebody on this call does know, but I'm not quite sure why it works it out like that. But all you need to remember is to get it to work out correctly, you basically have to add 24 onto everything, which is very, very odd. And you can do that through your format cells. So if you right click and go to format cells, and you want to make sure that you're looking at the time category just here. And the one that you're basically looking for is the one that's kind of got 24 added. So this one here that says 37, I can see that that's roughly got 24 ahead of it. And if I click OK, 
that's actually now the correct answer. So it works out in a very, very strange way, but don't be caught out by that. If you are adding up times, that's just a good thing to note as well. You can see here now that I've added that in, it's um, added on the seconds for me as well. And again, if you want to do anything like remove those seconds, you can go in and you can remove those through custom formatting. So again, if I right click my mouse and go to format cells, if I jump down to custom, and this is where you have all these weird and wonderful things in here. But you can see here at the top, it's got a sample. So it's showing exactly what I'm clicked on. And then underneath, it's showing me kind of the, the underlying format for that. So if you want to remove the seconds, it's a very simple case of just deleting them out like so. And you can see just above in the sample that that's now changed. So when I hit enter, it's going to remove those seconds. OK, so just a couple of little tips when it comes to using things like that. The total matches the format of the, 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 the cell that it's in. Yeah, I don't know if any of you heard that or what James was just saying. So somebody has put on put on the, in the chat uh, why it works out like that. So yeah, basically the total um, work when you put the total in, it's using the format of the current cell. So it's not until you reformat it that it's going to pick up the new format. So there we go. Thank you for that. Whoever put that into the chat window. Lovely. Thank you, Michael Hayes. <laughs> All right. Let's move along. Again, absolute and relative references is something which is fundamental. You need to understand this in order to be able to use any functions or start to construct your own formulas in Excel. And again, this is something which some of you might know, some of you might not know. Um, we're going to go through a very quick example, and then we're going to get on to some of the more advanced uh, functions and formulas that you might use. So just want to make sure that you've got these basics solidified in your brain before we go too, uh, too crazy with our, with our formulas. So absolute versus relative referencing. Now, by default, Excel um, will always work out your calculations using relative referencing. And I'm going to show you what we mean by that in case you're not sure what I'm talking about. So here, the data that we're using, we have a list of employees. Um, we have various pieces of information, including when they were hired, the years they've been there, their salary, their job rating, so on and so forth. And all of these lucky people in the list are getting a salary increase of £1,500. Lucky them, I say. And what we want to do is we want to work out what their new salary is going to be after this increase. So we could do that very simply, and I'm sure you can probably all sitting here work out how we can do that. We're going to type in equals, and then I could very simply click on cell G2 for the first salary, and then just do add 1,500. Press enter. There we go. That's correct, looks correct to me. And I can use my autofill handle. And if I double click, that's going to copy that formula all the way down. And I can just do a quick um, visual check, and everything looks all fine. So that works absolutely fine. Now, this is relative referencing. So if we double click to have a look in this first cell, you'll see here G2 plus 1500. If I go to the cell below and double click, that's changed to G3 plus 1500. Next one, G4, and so on and so forth. It will go down. So when I drag down, it incremented that number. That is relative referencing, and that is the default in Excel. However, there are some situations where that doesn't work at all. And I'm just going to undo out of here. Come all the way out and show you a different example where we would use something called absolute referencing. So instead of adding 1,500 or giving people a 1,500 pound increase to their salary, what if we want to increase everyone's salary by 3.07%, which you can see over here in cell L1. So let's go and construct our formula. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to do equals G2. Now, when you've got a percentage in here, we want to do um, multiplied by this and press enter. 
So that gives me that figure there. Now that is the amount that the salary is going to increase by. So it's not giving me the new salary. Okay. So I can look at that and I can immediately see what I need to do. I'm going to double click back on my formula and all I'm going to do is do plus the salary, which is going to give me the correct answer. So I think, hooray, I've got my correct answer. I'm going to copy that down and then I'm done. So I come to the corner, I double click my autofill handle, and whilst figures have been filled in, if I just do a quick visual check, aside from the first one, if I start to look, oh, they're exactly the same. So something hasn't quite worked here. Okay? And the reason is because, as I said, by default, Excel uses relative referencing. So if I go to the second cell down and double click, Let's look at this formula. So it's doing G3, which is highlighted here, which is correct, times, and because it's now gone on to L2, there's nothing in that cell because it's moved the, it's incremented the reference. We need this to always refer to cell L1. So you have to fix the cell essentially, and that is called absolute referencing. And the easy way to do that is just by adding dollar signs in front of the column number, sorry, the column letter and the row number. So if I just come out of here, I'm just going to do it on the first one. Now, a simple way of adding or making a reference absolute is just by clicking in that um, reference and pressing the F4 key on your keyboard, and that will put those dollar signs in the correct places. I unfortunately, <laughs> when I'm on a webinar and I have a microphone plugged in, I can't uh, use my function keys. It adjusts the volume for some reason. I don't know why. So I'm just going to very quickly just type them in manually. So I'm going to put a dollar sign there and a dollar sign just there, which is essentially what the F4 key would do. And press enter. And then I want to make sure that I'm going to copy that down again. And you can see now all the figures have changed. And again, if you just do a quick visual check, you'll see that those are now looking a lot better. And if we just kind of cherry pick one out of here, you can see it's still referring to cell L1. So that is the difference between relative referencing versus absolute referencing. A really, really important point to note when you're dealing with any function or formula in Excel. Lovely. All right. So we've covered a few kind of like the more advanced basics, I'll call those. Um, but it's always good to make sure that those are cemented in your in your mind. Let's open up our next spreadsheet where we're going to start to take a look at the if function. So we're going to do some ifs. We're going to do some nested if statements, some compound if statements. And we're also going to look at something called the ifs function. That's ifs with an s on the end. It's all very confusing. Um, so again, if, if is one of those really, really popular formulas that people use in Excel. And they're actually, in their simplest form, they're very, very easy to use. They can get extremely complex when you start getting into nested ifs. And I think you can have up to 64 nested ifs, which would be an absolute nightmare trying to read and work out. Um, but we're going to go through so you can see how you can construct them. And they're not actually that difficult when you just talk them out and work them through in your brain. They are one of the most powerful functions in Excel as well. All right, so let's start out with a simple if statement. So let's have a look at the data that we're using again here. So we have the same kind of data. So we've got our employee name, we've got the hire date, the years, their salary, and their job rating. And then we have a column, column I, ready for people's bonuses. Now, a scenario that we're going to have here is that this company has decided that for those people that have a job rating, job ratings in column H, a job rating of four or five, they're going to get a bonus of £3,000. Okay, so this is where we would use an if statement. And you can kind of work it through in your head because it sort of says, if your salary is this, then do this. If it's not, then do that. That's essentially what the formula is going to do. Now, again, you could use the dialog box if you wanted to. So, again, if you're new to formulas, that is something that I would advise. I actually find it easier not to use the dialog box on if statements, but that's it's entirely personal preference. You could go to formulas and you could search for your um, oops, um, you could search for your if uh, statement. So. It, it's picked up what I'm going to do in there, which is quite handy because that's what I was doing in there before. But um, you could search for your if through there if you wanted to use the dialog box. I'm just going to type in equals and I'm going to type if and I'm going to open my bracket. 
Now again, when you're constructing formulas in this way, so not using that dialog box, you will get handy little um, kind of instructional text, should we call this, underneath. And once you get used to this instructional text, it, it is very, very useful. And whatever's in bold at the moment, and you can see that the word logical test is in bold, that's kind of what you need to input into the cell currently. So Excel is asking me, what is your logical test? So I'm saying, if this person's salary, so I'm going to say if G2, and the criteria that we have is we want them to be a job rating of 4 or 5, so I want to say if G2 is greater than, oh sorry, not G2, what am I talking about? <laughs> if H2 is greater than or um, equal to 4, so that will give us the people who are on 4 or 5, and then we put a comma in, and if you look at the little text below, it then highlights the next thing. So the comma separate, separates all of your arguments, essentially. So the logical test is just saying, if the salary, oh, sorry, I keep, I keep referring to salary. I'm obsessed with the salary. I don't know why. If the job rating <laughs> is greater than or equal to four, then they're going to get 3,000. If it's not, so this is our second argument, so we put in, a little comma just there. If it's not, they're going to get nothing. Okay, and then we're going to close our bracket because remember, you must always close off your bracket and enter. So it's put a little dash in there. So I'm going to go and I'm going to double click to copy that formula down. So you should see now that the only people who have bonuses are those with job ratings of four or five, and then everybody else has a dash in there. So that is the simplest way to construct an if statement. Hopefully everybody is still with me on that. Um, another thing that I quite like to do, and I'm just going to control Z to undo, and double click back in here, is you can add text into here as well. So um, I put a zero on the end, which basically just meant that there was going to be nothing in that cell if they didn't meet this criteria. But what you could do is you might want to have some text in there, which says something like no bonus or, you know, whatever it is that you want it to say. So you can also, for this last argument, if we just remove the zero, and we could put in some text. Now, whenever you're putting in or you want to add in text that was within a function or a formula, you must put it in quotation marks like that. Okay, so I'm going to say, no bonus for you, and end my quotation marks like so. It's a little bit harsh. I'm sure you've written no bonus for you, nothing for you, <laughs> and then copy that down. And if you're um, concerned about the alignment, you can just align those so that they're all in line. But you can use text in there as well as the, the main point that I'm trying to get across. Lovely. All right. So while we've got this column highlighted, if you glance your eyes down to the status bar at the bottom, you'll also see that it's showing me a sum. So currently, it's showing me the total for all of the, the bonuses in here. So you can see at the bottom, it says sum, and then we're just over a million. So that's a good way of being able to see. So if I was the, the manager, I might only have a budget of one million for everybody's bonuses. So I can see that I'm just over. So I might then want to go in and reduce this. So make this slightly lower. So let's make it 2,800. And then copy down by double clicking. And now I can see by looking at the bottom that I, I, I'm under that one million target. So you can use other tools. There's a tool called Goal Seek, which you might have heard of or used before which will get um, get you exactly to a million and it will work it all out for you. We're not going to cover that in the session today, um, but if that is something which you ever need to do, there is um, a tool called Goal Seek. I think it's on the, the data ribbon under What If Analysis just here. So that's a good little tool for doing anything like that. Lovely. All right, let's move on to nested ifs. So this is where we start to get slightly more complicated. So bearing in mind what we've just learned from um, our basic if statement, and I'm just going to take these out. I think I accidentally saved when I was fiddling around with this spreadsheet this morning. Let's just delete these out. Lovely, and just make that a bit bigger again. 
Okay, so we're going to do something similar, but this time we're doing nested ifs. So we did a very simple if just now, but you can combine ifs. So you can have an if inside an if inside an if, so on and so forth, and you can have up to 64 ifs. I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> it would be a nightmare for anybody who's trying to read it, but you can have up to 64 if you so desire. So let's have a look at how we construct a nested if statement. So again, we're going to just do uh, what we did before. So we're going to say equals if, and we're going to say if um, the job rating is uh, greater than or equal to four, so anybody who has a job rating of four or five, they're still going to get 3,000, so comma 3,000. But then we're going to say if, they have a job rating of three, they're going to get 1,500. So we're adding another if statement within this if statement. Okay, and that is where we get the whole, where the nested ifs terminology comes from. So currently we have if H2 is greater than or equal to four, then they'll get 3,000. Then we want to do another comma, and we're going to add in another if and open the bracket again and add in our second one. So then we're going to say if H2 is equal to three, so if that job rating is three, then they're going to get 1500. Oops, 1500. If they don't meet any of those criteria, so if they have a job rating of one or two, then they're going to get nothing. Now, if I don't put anything in there, I'll get that little dash as I had before. If you want it to be blank, just put in two sets of quotation marks with nothing inside them and that will essentially give you a blank. Once you've done that you then need to close off your brackets. Now again when you're working with formulas you need to close off your, I keep saying brackets, I don't know if that's just an, an English way of describing these. I know in America we use parentheses. Do we use parentheses here as well? I've always said brackets growing up, I don't know why. I apologize if um, yeah, parentheses. Oh, I'll say parentheses. It sounds nicer than brackets. <laughs> you must always make sure you close off any open parentheses. So here, because I've got two open parentheses in this formula, I need to make sure that I put two to close them off. And that's really important as well. So however many open brackets, you must have the equal number of closed brackets. I said brackets again. I'm just going to stick with brackets because otherwise I get confused. <laughs> and then we're going to hit enter. I'm going to copy that formula down and you should see that that now applies. So let's just check back to make sure that that's working. So we give a 3,000 bonus to anyone with a job rating of 4 or 5 and I can see that that is correct so far. And we give 1,500 to anyone with a job rating of 3. And then everybody else who's on 2 or 1, there's just nothing in there. And again, you could, if I just control Z to come out of there, you could if you wanted to add in text in between there, so instead of having nothing, you could have no bonus or whatever it is that you want in there. We could go a step further and we could really start to ramp up our nested if statements by adding more in there. So we've got so far, we've got people who have a rating of four and five getting an extra 3,000. We have people with a rating of three getting an extra 1,500. Um, I'm not sure why we'd want to give someone with a job rating of two any money, but in this example, we're going to. So we're going to add in another one into here. So I'm going to click just after uh, the 1500, and we're going to do exactly what we did before. So we're going to type in if, we're going to open the bracket again, we're going to select the job rating, and this time we're going to say if that equals two, we're going to give them 99 pounds, like so and then uh, comma, and everybody else who's got a one should have no bonus. Oops. Aha, uh -huh. and you see what I did there? That's good because this is, I always do this. This is what I was just saying. I'm getting an error because I haven't closed off the brackets, which I was just telling you. So let's do, uh, let's just close that down. Oops. And you see, because I have three open brackets, I need three open on the end and I've only got two and that's why I was getting that error just there. I always forget it, so that's what that is four. And then if I double click to copy down, we should see that that now works as well. So we've got added to there, people with a job rating of two now have a 99 pound bonus and everybody else, poor little ones, get no 
bonus. Unfortunately, so hopefully you can see that once you work it through in your head, if statements aren't actually that difficult, the, the trick is just being able to get that syntax correct. And there are tools in there, the little tool tips underneath that will help you to get that syntax correct. Just moving on to uh, the next spreadsheet, so compound if statements. This is just when we're going to add in um, something like an and or an or um, argument or function in there as well. So you can add and, it's hard to say this, and or or into your if statements. So for example, we might want um, to pull out, we want, might want someone to match two pieces of criteria before they get the bonus. So we might say that the only people who are going to get a £3,000 bonus are those people that are full-time and have a job rating of uh, three and above, something like that. So that is where we would use the AND function within IF. So if I click in cell I2, I'm going to do equals, we're going to do IF. I'm going to open my bracket, but before I start to put in my criteria, I'm going to put AND in there and then open bracket. And then I'm going to construct my formula. So what we're going to say is we're going to say, we're going to say if um, F2, so this here, equals full time. So remember, if you're doing any kind of text, it has to go in quote marks. And this must match the, the correct, uh, the capitalization. It must be exactly right, exactly what the status says in order for this to work. I'm going to close that. So um, if it equals full time, and then I'm going to put a comma in. And if the job rating, so J2, is greater than or equal to 3, I'm going to close my bracket. If all of those are met, then they're going to get a £3,000 bonus. If not, they're going to get nothing. So again, we could put in the two quote marks to leave it blank, or we could put no bonus as we have been doing. And remember that you have to close off all of your open brackets. So for this one, I need to close off. I think I just need one on the end there, actually. And then we can copy that down. Okay, so that is how you can combine. So that is just kind of giving us uh, people who meet both of those criteria. So they must be full time and they must have a job rating over three. You could switch out AND for the OR option as well. So that will give you a slightly different result. So that's saying people who will get a £3,000 bonus if they're full-time or if they have a job rating above three. So it's a slightly different way of doing the formula. If I just recopy that down, you'll see that the numbers again will change ever so slightly. So those are worth having a little look at as well. It can be very, very useful just using the AND and the OR within your um, IF statements. And we call those uh, compound IF statements, essentially. Lovely. Speeding on, I know I'm going quick, but these sessions go so quick. There's so much I'd love to cover with you. We're just kind of getting started before uh, before uh, we have to finish, unfortunately. We've got about 10 minutes left, but I'm going to carry, just carry on. Yeah, oh, James, James says we're allowed 15 more because of his little debacle at the beginning with the sound. So that's good. That gives us five extra minutes. <laughs> All right, let's move on. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to talk about something called ifs. And this is just to make your life a little bit easier if you are doing a lot of nested if statements. This is just a quicker way of being able to, to put your ifs into your spreadsheet. So we're going to do one very, very quickly. Um, and I'm just going to set out our rules. Again, we're using the same kind of data, this whole job rating uh, system. So I'm going to set up a, an ifs statement. Um, with the rules. So if the job rating is four or five, they're going to get a bonus of 3,000. If their job rating is three, they're going to get 900. If the job rating is two, they're going to get 99. And if their job rating is one, they're going to get nada, nothing at all. And we can do this in a slightly different way. So previously, we kept typing in if and then referring back to the cell, if and then referring back to the cell. We don't actually need to do that by if we use the function ifs ifs or if s I don't know which um, which is the easiest way to say it but it looks like that so if we type in ifs 
open our bracket and we're going to say if the job rating, so H2 in this case, is greater than 3, then they're going to get £3,000. Now, in the previous example, we were then typing in another if statement and going back, but this time we're not going to because we're using if s or ifs. We're then just going to do comma and we're going to go for our second one. So then we're going to say um, if h2 is equal to 3, they're going to get 900. And we're going to carry on going. So comma, if the job rating is equal to 2, then they're going to get 99, comma, if the job rating is, oh, sorry, no, and we don't want to do that, so we're just going to go to 99, comma, and then everybody else, they're going to get no bonus. So those with the job rating of 1 are going to get nothing, unfortunately. So that is a slightly more concise way of typing your if statement. I know it doesn't look like it is, but it is actually uh, a little bit quicker um, than doing that. Oops. What have I missed out here? She says. This is where it can get complicated. I've missed something here. H2 is 99. Not quite sure what I've missed there. Um, no. H2 equals 99, comma, logical tests for. No, 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 no. No, I don't know what I've missed there. No, it's not liking that for some reason. I've obviously missed something out. I can't actually see what that is at the moment, which is unfortunate, but hopefully um, you get the idea with that, how you can use that ifs just to kind of push or uh, put all of those without having to write the if over and over again. I'm not sure why that's not working, which is a little bit annoying, but unfortunately we're going to have to move on because we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm just going to jump across into a different spreadsheet. I'm going to close that one down. And we're not going to save that. And we're going to move across to doing some lookups. So again, lookups are another really, really popular function in Excel. So you've probably come across things like VLOOKUP, HLOOKUP. So we're going to look at both of those. We're going to do approximate and exact matches. And we're also going to take a look at something called the index match as well, which is another way. It's kind of like a VLOOKUP, but instead of reading, for it reads the other way to VLOOKUPs, which I'll explain a little bit more when we get to it. So I'm just going to click on the uh, lookups tab down here. Now, VLOOKUPs and HLOOKUPs, what they essentially do, and if we take this example, we've got some social security numbers, employee name, job rating, salary, as we've been using the whole way through. And we need to find the tax rate for these people based on their salary. Now, the information relating to the tax rate is held in this little table just here. So you can see that between 5 and 25,000, the tax rate is 1%. 5%, 6%, so on and so forth. So what we want Excel to do is basically look up this salary in this range of cells and then tell us what the tax rate is for that particular salary. Now, when your data is going down the page vertically, that is a V lookup. The V stands for vertical. That is by far the most popular one that you will use. There is also an H lookup where your data runs horizontal across the page. So you can see here, we've got the same data, but it's running that way across the page. You're more likely to have it running this way. But sometimes maybe if you get sent a spreadsheet from an external source, you, they might have it running horizontally. So it's good to be able to do an H lookup as well. So that again, the H stands for horizontal versus vertical. So this is what we're going to use. We're going to do a VLOOKUP and an H lookup, and there are two different ways that you can do this. Something called approximate match and also exact match as well. So let's jump across to the approximate match spreadsheet first of all. 
Now what we mean by approximate match is in this first example we've got the salary here of um, £60,981. Now what I want to do is I want to obtain the tax rate from this table. Now I'm doing an approximate match because this number doesn't exactly appear in this list. You can't see 60,981 exactly. This is going to come out somewhere between uh, 55,000 and 65. So the rate that this actually will be is 5% for this one here because it's in between these two. So we want to do an approximate match. We're not doing an exact match because it doesn't exactly match what's in this table. Okay. Now the difference is that, that what you add on to the end of this formula, either a true or a false argument, that is the only difference between approximate and exact matches. So let's start to construct our VLOOKUP. We're going to do the VLOOKUP first of all. Again, you could go through your little functions dialog box. Again, I prefer to do them like so. So again, you've got your, your lookup value. So that is what are we, what do we want to look up? What piece of information do we want to look up in this table? So for this, it's the salary, comma, and you can see now in bold it says table array. So that means where do you want me to look for this number? So I want you to look for that number in this table just here. Comma, then it's saying, okay, so I'm going to look in this table. Which column in this table do you want me to pull this information out of? So we're looking for the tax rate. So the columns essentially are numbered, so one and two in this case, working from the left-hand side. So I want you to pull the information from comma, column two, comma, and then you can see here you've got two choices, true, which is an approximate match, or false, which is an exact match. Now remember I said we're doing an approximate match here because that number doesn't exactly appear, so I want to make sure I've got true on the end there. I'm going to close that bracket, and that gives me 5%. Now if I copy that down by doing autofill, some of them it's kind of got, but then it starts, we start to get into this not applicable, not applicable. So there's something going wrong there. And again, this relates to that absolute and relative referencing because when I've constructed this formula, the range that I've selected G1 to H13, which is this little table here, when I drag down, it's going to increment it down one by one. So eventually it gets down to these blank spaces down here, which is why we're getting not applicable. So you can get over this a couple of different ways. We could make this uh, an absolute reference like we did previously. So you can go in and you can press your F4 key to put, um, uh, what do you call them, dollar signs in front of your little formulas just here and press enter and then copy down. So that will keep that fixed. Alternatively, if we do control Z just to come out of here, and this is what I tend to do, um, you can name your tables, which works really well. So I could highlight this table, and then over here in the corner, in the left-hand side, this is our little name field. And this is where you can go to quickly name ranges of cells. So I could click in here, and I might want to call this tax underscore rate. The names, when, you, when you're naming ranges like this, you can't have any spaces in the name, so it has to be all one word or separated with an underscore or something along those lines, and press enter. So now that I've named this range, wherever I'm clicked over here, if I click the drop down, I can jump back to that specific range of cells, which is really handy for navigation, but it also works really well when you're using VLOOKUPs because it means that you can use the table name as opposed to having to highlight all of the data. If you're dealing with a large data set, that could be a bit of a pain. So again, if we just quickly construct our VLOOKUP, we go to equals VLOOKUP, open bracket, so our lookup value is C2, comma, our table array. Now you could press F3 on your keyboard and that will bring up any named ranges that you've got and you can just then select them, which is really, really useful. As I said, my function keys don't work, so I'm going to have to type in, but it has picked it up for me. You can see there, tax rate. I'm going to do a comma and the index number, so the column that I want to pick up the information from is 2, comma, and I want an approximate match, so I'm going to add true on the end there.
So you can do it that way as well and copy down. So a couple of different ways that you can do that, naming your table or making the range absolute, or you could do it highlighting both columns as well. I'm going to control Z to come out there and just show you very quickly an H lookup. It's virtually exactly the same except you going horizontally instead. So this information is exactly the same as what we've got in here. It's just uh, laid out in a horizontal way. So I'm going to click in the tax rate. I'm going to do equals, but this time I'm going to do H lookup. And it's exactly the same. So I could go in, I could highlight this, or I could name this table range. Now I haven't named it, so I'm just going to highlight going across like so and then I'm going to do a comma oh sorry it would help if I selected what I'm looking up first of all so I would select the salary first of all then comma then the table let's do that again very quickly then comma, and now it's asked me for the row index number. So when we were doing the, the VLOOKUP, it was asking for the column, but now it's asking for the row. So again, counting from the top, I want to have the, the tax rate, so that's the percentage, so it's row two, and we're going to do true because it's an approximate match, like so. So that is the way that you can do an HLOOKUP. It's pretty much exactly the same as a VLOOKUP. That's an approximate match, and I'm just going to move on to the next spreadsheet where we're doing a VLOOKUP, but this time we're doing an exact match. So you would use this in examples like we have on the screen here when you're looking for an exact match. So here we've got the name of some, um, let's say, some students, and we have their rating, so fair, satisfactory, good, poor. But what we want is we want to produce a numerical score for each student. And you can see we have a rate table over here, which tells us that excellent equals 99, very good 92, so on and so forth. So we want our VLOOKUP to look in the rate table for the rating and then give us the numerical value. Now what we're looking for this time is an exact match because I'm going to tell it to look up the word fair. So we want it to find exactly the word fair. So we're doing an exact match. So this is where it differs slightly from the VLOOKUP that we've just done. So we're going to construct it in the same way. We're going to do equals VLOOKUP, open bracket. This time we're looking up E2, comma, it's saying where are we going to look this up? So we're going to look it up in this table. And again, you could name the table to make that a little bit easier. Comma. And it's saying column index number again. So what do I want it to look up? We're looking for the score. So this is column two in the rate table. But this time, instead of doing true, we're going to do false because we want an exact match. And there we go. And again, if you wanted to copy that down, you would have to make these absolute or you would have to name the table and use that range as well. Okay, so pretty much exactly the same. But hopefully we've done a few of them now. You're kind of getting the idea of how we can use those. Nice and simple. Right, so it's 25 to 6 now. I'm probably going to run for about five more minutes. There's just a few text functions that I wanted to show you because we've mainly been concentrating on um, numerical functions. And as I said, there's, there's, we can't run through very much in, an, in 50 minutes or so, unfortunately. But um, I did want to just throw in some text functions as well. So let's close down this spreadsheet. And we'll go to our text worksheet. OK, some very simple ones which I find really useful. So. This is when we want to kind of um, clean up text in our spreadsheet. So you can see here we're on the trim page and we've got some information. We've got some contact names running down here and you can see that they're kind of not very well formatted. We've got some big gaps in the middle, some have got big gaps at the front, some have got big gaps at the end. It's not very consistent and this can sometimes happen if you do a role where you deal with a lot of data, if you import data from a database or if somebody sends you a spreadsheet or if you import it from somewhere else, then not your data doesn't come across perfectly all the time and there is all 
always a certain amount of uh, tidying data up before you go on to do other things. Particularly important if you're somebody who does a lot of things like pivot tables, um, your data needs to be kind of perfect perfect and clean and consistent before you start to construct your pivot table. So the trim function can really, really help with things like this. So cleaning up this data and it's the simplest function ever to use. You can click in cell B2 and I can do equals um, and we're going to do trim, open bracket and again it just tells us we just want to put in the text that we want to trim. So in this case cell A2, we're going to close that bracket and you can see it sorts out that text nicely for us. So we can then copy that down. And our data is all nice and trimmed. All of those leading and trailing spaces have been removed. And it looks nice and ready for us to, to do other things with that data. So just a very quick little function that's really, really handy. Another one that's really handy is the concatenate function. Now, if we move across here, now I think since the release of Excel 2013, I think this function was first in, since the release of the flash fill command, which I'm going to show you in a moment, um, sort of renders concatenate a little bit obsolete because um, it kind of does what concatenate does um, a lot easier and a lot quicker. But I'm going to show you both anyway so you can see. So what concatenate will do is it will essentially join text together. Um, so for example, if you've got a list of names, and this is quite common, and I'm sure you've come across this before, you've maybe been sent a spreadsheet where you have everyone's first name in one column, everyone's last name in another column, and maybe you just want to show them all in, in one cell essentially. So I just want it to have Mark Baker in the cell. You can join these up by using the concatenate feature. So we can do equals, and we can start to type concatenate, oops, it helps if I spell it right, concat, and you can see there, so I can then select it from the list, open bracket, and I can put in exactly what it is that I want to um, add together, essentially, so I can concatenate, uh, which way around should we do it, yeah, I'm just going to do cell uh, A2, so we want it to say mark, space, Baker. Now you have to tell Excel that you want the space to go in there. If I was just to put in or do a comma and then do the next piece of text, it's just going to put his name all together. So if I was just to do comma and then B2 and close it, it's going to give me Mark Baker or one word. If I want to make sure that there's a space in there, I need to tell Excel a space needs to go in. So in between the two names, after the first comma, I'm going to put in a space. So in order to do that, remember a space is essentially a character, so any character that you're putting in, you need to put in between quote marks as we've discovered um, already today. So we're going to do uh, space, end quote marks, and that will give me the format that I want. Okay, so that is a little formula just to do something like that. Now, the reason why I say this is obsolete is because the flash fill feature is a godsend in Excel. Um, released new for 2013, available again in 2016 as well. Don't believe it was in 2010, I think it came in in 2016. So if you have um, 2013 and above, then you should have this feature. It pretty much does exactly the same thing. Um, all you need to do is type in the first cell how you want it to appear. So I want it to look like that, sorry Mark Baker, not Barker. And then all I need to do is go to the uh, data tab, I think it's on, she says, yep, data tab, and you have in the data tools group, there's a flash fill button. Just click it once and it will fill them all down for you. So much easier than having to use the concatenate formula, but there are some instances where concatenate, because you can get quite complex with that, concatenate will be more useful to you in that scenario. And just uh, one more before I leave you, because I know we are running over and I don't want to keep you too long, is just the proper command. Again, this is great if you have data that you're trying to clean up. So again, if you have data, for example, that's all in uppercase and you want to make it what we call proper text. So proper is essentially the capitalization of the first letter of each word. You can do that very simply by typing in proper, open brackets, and that will do that for you. If you wanted to make it all lowercase, there is a, a function called lower 
as well, and also one for upper if you wanted it all in uppercase. So those are just a couple of text functions which I find really useful when I'm working in Excel. I'm so sorry we're going to have to stop the webinar right there. Like I've run over already. As I said, this is such a vast subject. We might have to do a advanced formulas and functions two, part two essentially, and cover off some more of the functions. But hopefully you found that useful. As I said, the way that I've picked them was really just trying to go a little more into the most popular things that people use, which in general are things like ifs and uh, vlookups and uh, some of the text functions and things like that. I think we'll have time for a couple, couple, of, couple of questions, questions if anyone's got any. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's, that's if anybody's got any. There are quite a few questions. Um, I mean, it's really difficult because there are so many to, to find uh, one or two to give you right now. Um, one, one thing that I wasn't sure um, whether this was clear or not, just there when we were doing VLOOKUPs, was just for people who hadn't done them before, as Michael pointed out, that um, tables needed to be sorted. Yes. I thought that would be really good for people to know, and I thought, great. Um, so, oh, so Nicholas, I, Nicholas wanted to know, does trim work only on lists, or could it work for the formatting of completing sen complete sentences? Um, um, no, it, oh, so can you mute your mic? Yeah, of course I can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get this huge echo. No, trim um, can work on, on sentences as well. So it will basically remove spaces. So if you had a sentence which had loads of errant spaces or leading or trailing spaces, then yeah, you can use it to remove those as well. You can also use it in combination with another function called clean, which will do things like remove line breaks and things like that. So quite often you'll see the trim command used alongside clean. Um, so that is another function to look at. So if your role, uh, which it sounds like it might be, is to deal with a lot of data, maybe you get a lot of raw data and you have to clean it up, trim and clean are definitely two functions that I would have a little, a little look at because you can use them together to clean up that data nicely. Just another really, really short one. It's just Nicola wanted to know when you're doing a VLOOKUP, can you name the table that's in the other function? Yes, yes, you can. Um, so, is your mic on or did people hear you? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I, I should. So, so much muting and unmuting to avoid the feedback. I, yeah, I just asked Deb uh, a question via Nicola, which is can you name the table that's in a different sheet? Yes, you can, absolutely. So, yeah, if you have, um, yeah, you don't have to have, obviously in my examples, I've got all of my data nicely together on one sheet, but it might be that you have your, your tables spread across different sheets, even across different workbooks, essentially. Um, so, yeah, you can name tables on different sheets and use those in VLOOKUPs, absolutely, you can, yes. Great, thank you, Deb. So, I mean, there are a lot of you who have had questions, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and get back to you via email. Unfortunately, we don't have time now uh, because we're 15 minutes over. Um, thank you so much for all of your questions, and as I say, we'll, we'll take a good look through them uh, this evening and tomorrow. Um, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, I hope it's been as informative for you as it has for me. Um, thanks to Deb, uh, as usual. Uh, it's, it's great to just sit here and and try and take it all in. Um, so, yeah, once again, thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to end the webinar here. Uh, have a lovely week. Um, we will be doing a webinar actually next week on VBAs, so you should uh, you should receive uh, an invite for that soon. Also, for people who are interested in membership, we currently have uh, an offer on which uh, includes a, a free 25 pound, 20 pound rather, or $25 Amazon voucher. Um, so if you're interested in that at all, uh, just get in touch with me. Um, so yeah, for, for, for recordings of this webinar and for that, and anything else question, question wise that you might have, please email me uh, at info at webinarsteam.com. That's info at webinarsteam.com. Thank you very much. Oh, Deb's put it up because she's so great. Thank you, Deb. Um, yeah, so any questions, whether it's the recording, anything you like, just uh, just let me know.
All right, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, goodbye.